They're lying. Because she doesn't know where it is. <laughs> Have you ever heard someone ask you, or have you ever been asked, or told what you mean to God? How much He loves you? What He's done for you? Have you ever heard the corollary? What does God mean to you? According to statistics, 93% of the world's population believe in a supreme being. Only 7% are atheists. In the U.S., only 75% of people believe in a supreme being. 25% are considered atheists. Now, the Bible says very clearly that God is manifest in the unseen things. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being, un being, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that men are without excuse. God has revealed himself in what he has done. So if you really come to God, the first thing you must do is believe that He is. Believe that He is God. Of the 93% of the people, of the world's population, only 33% are Christian. They are the ones who at least nominally believe that Jesus Christ came to earth. I believe in John 3.16 that said that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. So 33% of the world apparently believe that. But is that enough? Because it says in Matthew that not everyone who says Lord, Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but those who do the work of the Father. How many people actually do the work of the Father? Many people will say that I believe, but I've never been asked to do anything. It's never been requested of me to do something. I've never been called to do something. But it says in Romans 8.13 that whom he predestined, these he also called. Now we've had discussions over predestination many times in churches. But if you look at Ephesians, it says this. He chose us in him before the, before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. If you go with that, we are all predestined to become sons of God. We are all called to do something. We are all called to be in that family. But most of us are reluctant to do anything. We're reluctant because we don't feel we're called. Now, reluctance is not something which is new. There are examples in the Bible of people being reluctant to do things. Many people don't hear God because they don't listen. God speaks to most of us very quietly, very silently. And he stands by and sees if we will respond. He's not doing it in an overt fashion or in a dramatic fashion. He's just calling us very quietly. And it says in the Bible, if you seek him, 
you know, find him. But there are examples where he's called people out very abruptly and very dramatically, even those who have resisted him in the past. It says, for example, in Acts 1 to 4, because even the apostles were reluctant to do what he, was, he asked them to do. He asked them to go into all the world and spread the gospel. But they all stayed in Jerusalem because it was comfortable there. So in Acts 1 to 4, it says a great, a great persecution arose against the church and drove all the believers out of Jerusalem. And as a result of that, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. You see, God got what he wanted, but he did it in a different way. Paul was a great example himself. He was someone who was zealous against Christianity, zealous for the Jewish faith, zealous because he wanted to protect Judaism from any intrusion by other religions. But God had different plans. God had called him to do something else. And so when Saul didn't accept it, God knocked him off his horse and blinded him. I'll get your attention. <laughs> and he did. Because it says that he was chosen. He was chosen to preach to the Gentiles. Jonah was chosen to go to Nineveh and preach to that city. He said, no way. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go in the other direction. So he boarded a ship. God said, I've got news for you. So he sank the ship, which had a storm, and Jonah ran it up in the belly of a big fish, who spit him out on the shores of Nineveh. <laughs> I got your attention, right? He was called. He was called. And we can't forget Moses, who at the age of 80, after being a shepherd for 40 years, being very comfortable, married with a family, suddenly saw this burning bush, and he was called by God to go back to Egypt to rescue God's people. He said, no, I'm, I'm a nobody. I can't go. God said, yes, you can. He said, I have no authority. God said, I'll give you the authority. He said, Pharaoh won't be interested in what I have to say. God said, yes, he will. <laughs> and then he said, well, I'm a terrible speaker. So God said, I'll send someone else to speak for you. Just go. The whole point of this is that we are all called. And most of us are reluctant to do what we're called to do. We're told to be still and know that he is God. To be still and know that he's calling you. To be still and listen for that small voice. He doesn't have to be dramatic like he is with some people. But the idea of these examples are twofold. Want to know that even the patriarchs, even the heroes of the Bible were reluctant to do things. So it's not unusual for us to be reluctant too. But they did it. They ended up going where God sent them and doing what God asked them to do. But the second thing is that each one of these people had to suffer something before they went. And you have to wonder, when you look at the world around us, how much of the suffering is going on because we're just not listening to what God is telling us to do. How much suffering as a world, how much suffering individually occurs because God is telling us to do something and we're not doing it. I don't know. But that's something everyone has to figure out for themselves. The Bible says we are all called 
and we are all expected to answer God's call. Yes. How much suffering we may prevent by doing so is something only you and God will know. But it is something to think about.